So I, I didn't know I would be getting um, the after immediately after lunch session. Um, so we're going to try to keep it interactive. Seriously, do ask me questions if you have any while I'm going through. Um, and I will try to remember, and it's your job to help remind me, to repeat the questions into the microphone so that they have them for the recording. So thank you ahead of time for reminding me of that because I will forget. Open source software could save libraries. Maybe. Part one. I proposed a 45 minute talk, not really thinking about the full scope of problems that libraries face <laughs> with technology. Um, and it, it seems like there's, a, there's kind of a natural split between the sort of front end UX problems that we pass on to our users and the sort of back end management of everything in libraries problems that we deal with as librarians. I'm a web services librarian. I build websites for the users, so the part closest to my heart is the UX stuff. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I want you to understand today why library websites are mostly awful. I don't want to make it categorical they're all awful. Some of them probably aren't. But pretty much they're all awful and pretty much all have to be, and I'll explain. Um, I want to propose a simple open source software project that might help fix it. And then I'll give you a very short preview of the sort of things that might show up in a part two of this talk. So, why are library websites so often so bad? We have a lot of things that we're trying to present all at once, and it's a little tricky. I'm going to go into more detail. Before I give you examples, I kind of want I want everybody to be kind of on the same page about this. There are a bunch of different types of libraries. I see people nodding along. My examples are all going to be academic libraries, which is that's kind of where I live, but that's not these problems face all libraries are facing these problems, kind of to varying degrees perhaps. The other reason is academic libraries tend to have more money and tend to have more developers, so they just make better examples right now. Uh, the other thing that I want you to know is libraries don't just have books. Okay, good. No one seems surprised. <laughs> um, we have tons of electronic content um, that we buy these license from vendors. And the electronic content comes in on these huge platforms. We don't go out to the individual uh, journal publisher or even book publisher and say, hey, sell us this particular journal. We do, but it's not, it's an edge case. Most of the time, if we want, say, the journal Nature, we go to, I don't actually know who sells Nature, I'm gonna lie to you. <laughs> we go to EBSCO and we go, okay, we would like your science journals package, which happens to include Nature. And so we get a bunch of journals from one provider, which are given to us on a platform, which is, it's, it's kind of this, whole UI deal. And for historical reasons, and because we have not yet come up with a better term, we call them databases. So when I say databases for the rest of this talk, I mean those platforms that are sold to us with content in them. I don't mean what anyone else in the building means. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about library website users. Hopefully all of you are library website users, so you're all just going to nod along and go, yes, that's me. Library website users are website users. They have been using Google, they've been using Amazon, Netflix, whatever. And they have expectations built up around these, these interfaces that have a lot more money and a lot less concern about user privacy than libraries do. <laughs> um, right. Um, they don't expect that they have to become an expert on the library and how the librarians think to have to use the website. They just want stuff. Not even all of the users really can have a strong distinction in their head between the stuff that's about the library, like the library hours, and the stuff that the library pays to provide, like the journal Nature. They just want stuff. So they go to this very fine library website. This is my library website. There are many others. This one happens to be mine. 
Um, <laughs> and I'm really proud of how few links it has, believe it or not. Um, as library websites go, this is fairly plain. <laughs> so, there's no carousel. what's that? There's no carousel. There's no carousel. I know. That's <laughs> right? Um, when they come here, they're like, okay, there's a search box. Great. I know what to do with search boxes. I know exactly how search boxes work. I'll put it in the library hours. Wait. Okay, I'll put it in the library hours. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. And they get a spec kick about, about how to extend library hours. Um, yeah, that, that wasn't what they wanted. We'll go back up. Sorry, I, I got very excited, y'all. Here is the stuff we pay for. This is, this is the stuff the librarians think is very important. And we're right, because it's very expensive, and we want people to get to it. Here is, okay, so this is, this is what you would expect you would be able to use to access all of the content on the library website. Um, the stuff we pay for, the stuff we don't. As I said, you can't. Here's all the stuff that is not represented in Quick Search. A couple of these, I'm, I'm being a little dishonest, like we could put archives and special collections partially in Quick Search. There's a couple of these that like, I'm kind of waving my hands a little bit, all right? But overall, most of our library website, you can't actually access through the search box. So really quickly, so that you understand kind of what Quick Search is and partially why our library website isn't in it, it is this really popular thing in libraries now to buy what we call discovery layers. And all they are is these big indexes, indices if you prefer, of content that they've negotiated with individual publishers to get. Now remember, the library doesn't negotiate with individual publishers as a rule. We generally negotiate with big platform providers like ProQuest and EBSCO, who both sell discovery services. So you can see how this could be a problem and how maybe not everything would be represented in this discovery service because it requires a lot of trust and I'm guessing a lot of money to go to a journal pub. Oh, go ahead. So are those discovery layers standardized? I'm sorry, right? Yeah, you have your, so you have one, two, three, four. Oh, these are they standardized? I uh, mean, like normalized between how they search? No. Or Oh, uh, are they is all the same? Oh, that's a good question. So is is Summon, EBSCO Discovery Service, and Primo, and there are probably a couple of others, are they all the same? No, they are not the same because they're going out and they're saying, okay, hey, publisher, I want you to give me everything, all of your stuff, all of your full text, things that libraries pay millions of dollars for, overall, not each library. Um, and we want to index it. We want to index the data, we want to index the metadata, title, author, yeah. And then we want to provide a searchable index to libraries. And we promise that we won't give them anything they haven't paid for. We will give them a mechanism to link to their paid content, but we will not provide them with any content through this, this discovery layer. And that is the promise they make. And because they are a big company and they have some pre-existing relationships with these these publishers, they get away with it. I say get away with it. Like this is this is a good thing overall. But ProQuest has different relationships than EBSCO has, and I don't even know what Ex Libris has going on. So not everything is in the discovery service. For our library, it's between 60 and 90 percent of everything we pay for. That is a huge range. We don't know what's in this discovery service, and that's a little upsetting. The real name of the one we pay for is Summit. Uh, because we are a library, we immediately rebranded it to something else, so we call it Quick Search. So those two things are interchangeable for the rest of the talk. I'm going to walk you through what you would do if you want various types of things on this library website. I just want you to believe me that this is a representative website. I'm using mine because I happen to know of the nuance, and if you ask me a hard question, hopefully I can answer it. Um, but I'm going to go fast, and the point is to confuse you, okay? All right, 
So, let's say you want books. You can search quick search, and as long as you want physical books, they'll be in there, for sure. Our whole library catalog, which is the thing that we have built to search for physical books, and it has some other stuff in it too. All of that is indexed in quick search. However, when you search for a book in quick search, if you happen to find it, you click on it and it takes you to the library catalog. Because as you all remember from your trip to the library last week, every book has a location. Or elementary school or whatever. There's the Dewey Decimal number. Quick search doesn't know about those things. It doesn't know if the book's been checked out. It doesn't, it has to link you to the catalog. So we normally the librarians, and anybody who's been trained by a librarian will just search the catalog first when they want a physical book. If you want a physical book the library doesn't have, you'll search WorldCat, which is a whole bunch of different libraries combining their catalogs together into a big union catalog. And then you can use, and this is super valuable but not open source specific, you can use interlibrary loan to get books from pretty much anywhere. Good, there are people nodding, but this is a super really cool thing that not everyone knows exists, so a little bit of library marketing. And I'm going to have a little swishy by subjects until we talk about subjects because everything is sort of under subjects. All right, let's say you want Time Magazine, the Anchorage Daily News, okay, uh, the New York Times, or the Journal Nature. I keep picking on them. You can try quick search, and there's a 60 to 90 percent chance that what you'll find that you'll find what you want. You can try these other things. You can search for journals under library catalog. I don't recommend it. It's not that's not what catalogs were made to do. We do put them in there, at least the journals that we have physically in the building. The right place to go is journal titles. <laughs> yes, if you want a newspaper, you click on journal titles. Right. But let's say you don't want Time Magazine, you want a specific article from Time Magazine. Or you just want a bunch of articles about magpies. That's, every librarian has a default search, that's my default search. <laughs> you can again try your luck with Quick Search, and it might work out for you. But the right place to go is databases. So you click databases. There are 245 different databases. What are you going to do? You know, you're going to give up and leave in tears. Um, hopefully not. But we do try to offer some help. So if you there's a specific database and you want to know if it's in Quick Search, we do offer little icons to say this is in Quick Search. We know at least some of this is in Quick Search. None of this is in Quick Search. Ebooks are newer than article databases. And they are part of article databases now. So ebooks are just a disaster. Um, some of the ebooks are in the library catalog, as many as we can add. Some ebooks are in WorldCat. Don't look in WorldCat for ebooks, just don't do it. Um, a lot of them are under this databases link. Pretty much all of our ebooks are somewhere under our databases link. And as you can guess, some of them are in Quick Search, but we don't know how many. So there's this ebooks link that we try to offer to help. And it's kind of the databases page again, only it's, it's smaller. There are only 34 databases that contain ebooks. There is this title search up at the top, which is, you know, is nice because if you know the title of an ebook, I think this searches all of our ebooks. You can forgive me for being a little confused about what searches what, I hope. So we try to help because we know that this is terrible. So we offer this link called subjects because we hope to ourselves that if you're doing a research assignment on, let's say, computer science, you'll think to yourself, computer science is a subject. And it takes you to this curated list. A committee of librarians came up with what our top level subjects would be. You can tell it's a committee based on the variability of how big these subjects are. <laughs> and then you would click computer science, and it'll take you to this very nice little web page. Um, I, I say that semi sarcastically because, like, what are the odds you're going to get there? But it is trying to be helpful. I'm also not making fun of it because that guy with the beard is in the bus. Um, so you know I'm not picking on him. We offer four or five sometimes six or seven, it depends on how much self-control the librarian has, 
top choices for databases where you can search for material on this subject. And then there's this really cool up here in the top corner that this, we offer quick search again. But this is a constrained quick search experience where you're only searching things in the discipline of, in this case, computer science. It's really nice and for a lot of reasons there's no way for us to offer this particular search from our front page. We wish we could. <laughs> right. Um, this is why we don't have a link titled books, like you would expect we might, or ebooks, or articles, or serials, which I didn't even tell you that's what we call journals, magazines, and newspapers. We also call them periodicals. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So I did put this in, I labeled this as a beginner track kind of thing, and not everyone is super hot into the mechanics of how search works. So I want to talk to you about the two different kinds of search. Um, so I get an idea of how much detail does everyone, if you know what enterprise versus federated search is, raise your hand. Okay, good, good. I will explain then because it was a very small number of people. Enterprise search. Now, uh, this is a possible bridge between the subjects, and it seems like a good time for the question. So, okay. uh, if you have a set of information and you're looking for something that's not in the set, it can be a difficult computing problem because in some models you have to exhaustively search the entire set. And so, that's essentially, it sounds like that's what you're saying is kind of the underlying problem of starting with that home page and having one thing you're looking for is you end up having to search everything to find it. Be because the underlying technology does not have the connection. Right. If so the question was if you want to search outside of some preset set of materials, that's a really hard computing problem. And is the problem I'm proposing here that you cannot in fact search everything with current technology. That is exactly the problem I'm proposing. Uh, spoiler, the solution I propose still does not search everything. But it does matter. Okay, so thank you. thank you. So you may or may not know about that Google does not actually search the internet. Okay, this is this is valuable information here. Uh, Pro librarian stuff. They send out little web crawlers, and the web crawlers send back the full content the content of whatever web pages they find. Uh, they send back the metadata, they send back how many places linked <coughs> these web pages, and it's all it's all saved in Google's index. So when you search Google, you're searching their index of the entire internet, not the entire internet. This is a fun and interesting fact. Some is the same way. They have gone out and they have made these deals with these publishers, and they have a preset index. That's why it's so fast. Some is a very fast search. It's great. Um, so when I seem to be slamming discovery services, I actually really like them, and they're a huge step forward, but that's an enterprise search. You, you send your search query down, and it, it searches a preset index, and it comes back, and it's fast, and it's one set of results. Federated search, which is what we used to use in libraries, and we still do, and I'm going to propose that we still do, is slightly different. You send your search to a program. And the program then sends out calls via APIs, or there are some kind of ancient protocols that we use in libraries that are, I don't consider them APIs. Um, however they send the query out, they send it out to a bunch of different, hopefully, indexes. Um, but a bunch of different services. And those services return results as quickly as they can. And then the program does something with it. Um, my experience, Having used a federated search that we bought from a vendor for several years is that they aren't great. I mean, they can be, they have their place, and there are good, good ways to do them, and we'll talk about those, but if you take the top 10 results from all of the different databases that you're querying, and you try to do relevancy ranking on just those top 10 results, you are lying. Because not every database is going to offer the same relevancy, and the least relevant things at the bottom of your, let's say you're querying 10 things and it's 100, 100 results, 
are going to be way less relevant than what you're implying to your user. They're also super slow. Not all of these services return in a timely fashion. And if you have to wait until everything's back before you can prioritize and, and it's terrible. It's just terrible. So, we're going to go back to library websites now, now that you are all experts on search. And anyone affiliated with libraries in the room is like, okay, of course, on CSU. They have a whole castle of developers. This is the thing that they do for the library community. They are, we all look up to them as, well, I don't know, maybe we don't all look up to, I look up to them. Because they're smart, they like to give back, they develop cool stuff, and look at their web page. Their web page is cleaner than my web page. I can admit that, I'm an adult. Part of the reason their website is so clean is that they believe they can rely on their single search box. They trust their search box more than I do. And they have good reason. When you search for maps, this is a nice kind of, what do you mean by this term? Do you want library maps or do you want, no one knows. Um, it doesn't really matter what you search for, they offer you the same interface every time. But they break it up into articles, they're searching their sum and instance. Books and media, they're searching their catalog. As we scroll down further, journal titles, remember that. So it's also newspaper titles and magazine titles. Database titles, so if you had gone in and searched for, academic search for me is a very big popular database, it would be right at the top of, of this middle bento box, that's what we call, we call this approach the bento box approach because you return a bunch of results in the middle. It's actually a really cute term for it. And then they've got this databases by subject thing, um, and then of course they return their results for the, from their website from the frequently asked questions. And if by some chance the thing you wanted wasn't in any of these bento boxes, they have four more searches for you that you can track. So, I mean, this is good. I, I like this a lot. It's a little confusing, and if what you wanted was the library's map, you're going to have to scroll down pretty far before you get it. So, it's really good, and I'm not picking on them. But it's not perfect. I think we can make it better. University of, Il of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. They do not rely as heavily on their search box. They do not trust it. They don't even trust it as much as I trust my search box. And that's okay. It's older. They have a smaller team of developers. I'm not picking on them either. They are clearly doing federated search as well, right? But they tell you how many hits you get instead of what you get. This is, I think, slightly less useful. Um, but it's okay. I wanted to show you the more useful, the most useful thing they do, which is these suggestions at the top. I like how I keep gesturing at my computer screen like that's going to help you. <laughs> Up here at the very top, they have these suggestions. And, and if you search for maps, it turns out there's a journal, a magazine, or a database that has the word maps somewhere in its title. And they pull that up to the top and they present that to you as the first link, and that's awesome. That is a really cool thing that they're doing. They also bring up a libguide, which is, you remember the little website that the guy with the beer made? That's what libguides <coughs> are. They're these, you know, we make them to help. Librarians are trying really hard to help by creating these libguides. So, they bring their libguides up to the top if there's a match. This is really cool. I really like that they're trying to help their users in this way. And I, I'm going to propose kind of combining these approaches to make a better search. This is just, if you scroll down their page, you get even more links from how many matches you got. So tech conference, let's talk tech really briefly. Um, here is what NCSU uses to put together their page. Um, if anyone here is from NCSU, I would love to talk to the you about why they use three different indexing open source products. I know there must be a good reason, I just I don't know what it is, and I'm super curious. Um, they use something called Nutch, which is from Apache. They use something called Swishy, which makes their remember databases by subject. And then they use Solar, which is a very popular, also Apache, kind of indexing and search sort of open source project. Nutch, I think, is, is the smaller piece. Oh. And Solar is the indexing and search. Okay, so to repeat, Nutch is a crawler and Solar is indexing and search. So there you go. Thank you. 
Um, they do also have this, this proprietary, they're, they're using Summon's API, and Summon, to their credit, yes, they're closed as all get out, but their API is really good and really responsive. So um, that is the one piece of vendor software. These ones that I worked in green with the um, horizontal lines, I can't tell that they're contributing these back to the library community at all. It is possible that they are, and I just didn't find it. It is also possible that they are so customized to NCSU's particular situation that they wouldn't be worth sharing. Either could be true. Um, but as you can see, a whole ton of technologies are kind of going into this page, and it's, and it's a pretty good page as a result. And you might see, so the reason they don't have a cool screenshot, NCSU knows that the rest of the library community looks to them for kind of cool tech ideas. UIUC, that's not their thing. All of their web pages are for their users, and I can respect that. That's fine. But they are using something really call, cool called Viewfind, and that is kind of a, it gives libraries and actually a, a bunch of different organizations that aren't libraries use it. There's some government agencies. There's a bunch of different things. It gives you a really nice way to offer a really customized search experience to your patrons or your users. Um, a lot of people, libraries, run Summon through Viewfind because they don't like Summon's <coughs> interface and they want to be able to customize it. Viewfind is a really good piece of open source software. And then they use a bunch of proprietary APIs to talk to Viewfind. I want there to be a single search. You just go to the library website and there's a search box right in the middle. And sure, there are other links, but if you type in your query, you get your answer. That's what I want. We're not going to get there, so let's talk about what we can do. <laughs> I think that we can combine these two approaches with a couple of, a couple of changes in how it's done um, and end up with a really nice user experience that's very close to this one search thing that, that I wish we had. We can't do a true one search because we can't index all of this content. It is against the EULAs, uh, end user license agreements, with our vendors to go crawling their stuff ourselves, which is a bummer. And we don't have the kind of trust and the kind of money and the kind of clout to go to the individual publishers with whom, remember, we don't have deals for the most paid, mostly. And say, hey, can we index all of your content? We promise not to provide it to our users unless we pay for it. Right. And we're certainly not going to get ProQuest or EBSCO to do this since they want to sell us discovery services. So we are not going to have an index of every piece of content. But we have the right to index our own websites. We can index our libguides. We can index our lists of databases. So we can do kind of what NCSU has done, and then we can use our Discovery Services API, so yes, I'm still advocating for paying for Discovery Services, and get almost everything. It would, be, it would still be a vast improvement. And maybe it would help push those last publishers who aren't working with the Discovery Services into doing so. Do you have an estimate for what percentage of stuff is almost everything? Uh, it, would be, it would be the same percentage of paid content. So, I'm sorry, the question was, do I have an estimate of what percentage of stuff the almost everything would be? 95 to 98? Um, there isn't that much content on, the, on a library's website. Oh, oh. So it would be everything on the library's website, including the list of databases and the list of journals, because we have access to that. And then it would also be the 60 to 90 percent of our paid content that our discovery service can provide us access to. So. Not access, search. It's very important. Um, so I think that, yeah, we will end up with a bento box interface, and I think that's okay. So here's what I propose. Oh, wait, no. Let me, let me tell you what we can do to kind of make this better. We can analyze search terms. <coughs> we can go, okay, library, library maps. We've got a good guess what they want. And we can preset obvious things like that. They're searching for library hours or library maps. There's a good chance they want the library website. If they're searching for almost anything else, there's a good chance they want content that we have paid for. And we can improve it over time. This technology exists. We can record what people search for 
what they click on. We can be really fancy and like if they click the back button, we can unrecord it and then record the next. Day. We can go as fancy as we want with this, but we can improve these best bets over time. And we can probably build this as a module for viewfind. Like I want to make sure that I have help on this project before <laughs> I go talking to anybody. So I haven't asked viewfind, but they seem like nice people. So I'm, I'm hopeful that they would kind of let let a group of us build onto viewfind. Here's the kind of naive, simple way that I am sure is possible. You reorder the mental boxes. <coughs> so exactly the same stuff NCSU is doing, pretty much. But if they're searching for something that's most likely to be on the library website, pop that up top. It wouldn't actually look like this. You wouldn't actually repeat the bento. You would reorder all of them. I'm just kind of, this is a, so people understand what's going on kind of thing. And this would still be a tremendous improvement, I think. Uh, it would be a lot less confusing for users. This one I'm less sure about. I think that there's some, I'm, I'm no more of an expert on search than now you are. So, um, maybe it would be possible to pull up individual results, or maybe you would face the same problem with slowness. I'm not sure. I think you'd have to do some clever caching, and you have to, this would require a lot of cleverness to be able to implement, but I think it might be possible to have individual links. So if they search for maps, and most people click on the library building map, have that be first. And if the second most people click on some book, have that be second, and so on. That would be even better, right? That would be the coolest thing we could possibly offer. Maybe version two. I do have one more constraint. We are not Google. We are not Amazon, and we are not Microsoft. Posted our name earlier. We're also not Netflix. We cannot track individual users. If we build software that tracks individual <laughs> users, and I mean beyond the session, okay? Like, librarians are not on Google. Not about that. <laughs> um, we cannot keep the IP address or anything identifiable about the person who does the search. We can keep the search term, we can keep what they click, uh, clicked on, there are already, someone already does this, and everyone's fine with it, but we cannot keep that user's content. And we can't leave a cookie on the machine, so we have to be really really careful about individual users. Um, so we're not going to be able to track them between the sessions, none of that. So, you know, this is still not going to be Google. It's still not going to be Amazon, and that's okay. It'll still be better than what we have. So I did put this talk in the business track, so, you know, I'm sure that all of you, everyone in the room is going to want to participate uh, with, out of the goodness of your heart for free. But just in case, I want to let you know that libraries will pay for software as a service, even if it is open source. <laughs> Having servers is expensive. Having a sysadmin is expensive. And libraries, a lot of them, especially the smaller ones, do not want any part of that. They will pay you to set up, configure, make it work with their particular group of APIs, and run software for them, even if that software itself is free. This is a sustainable business model. It's been done before, and it'll be done again. If you don't want to become a web host, there are also businesses that take open source software, and here I'm thinking of Viewfind, and all they do is install it and configure it for the libraries on the library's own server, and make it look awesome, and they add some CSS, and they pick the particular metadata that shows up, and they're paid for this, and that's all they do, and they're successful. So both of these are totally valid approaches if you want to make money off of open source with libraries. And everybody will be happy. The libraries will be happy to pay you, as long as it's reasonable. <laughs> and, and you'll be happy to get money. But it's okay, because you all want to do this for free out of the goodness of your hearts. Seriously, if you want to work on this, come talk to me. I'm really interested in working on this, but I do not, as you may have guessed from <laughs> some of the things that I left open as I was talking, I do not myself have all of the expertise that needs to go into building this. Um, I also know a number of very smart librarian developers who I could pull in to help us if this becomes an actual project. Really quickly, if there were a part two of this talk, it would be about the mess <laughs> that is the back end of running a library. <laughs> 
So, you may not know this, but every library has a huge, huge piece of software that we use to do everything pretty much from acquiring material through inventorying it, knowing where it is on the shelves, checking it in and out, marking it missing if it's gone, the cataloging, you know, that's all. It's huge. It's called an integrated library system. And it was built for physical materials, so we have an entirely different huge system for our electronic materials. I'm not joking. And there are vendors trying to fix this. But it's already really scary to change an ILS because you have so much put into it. It has so much of your data. It's scary to change an electronic resource manager for the same reason. If a vendor has both of those for your library, that is a really bad situation to be in because they can charge whatever they want. So this would be a really good place for open source to kind of come in and help. And there are, you know, there's Koha, there are there are little pieces. Coral is an electronic resources manager that's open, open source. Remember how I said that Salmon and these other discovery services could provide a link to the material that you have paid for that's in a whole other platform? There's a whole system for making those links work. It's called OpenURL. Um, and there is an open source OpenURL resolver. And then Drupal and WordPress have very active library communities as well. And lots of modules or plugins as appropriate that are built to work with libraries. So there's a ton more to talk about that is library open source and that is library's need for open source. Um, and if someone wants to do part two or wants to join me in doing part two, I'm interested in talking to you about that too. Um, at this point, are there any questions that you didn't ask during? Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to let you sort of finish your thought. Um, have you have you given any thought in terms of search to the um, Library of Congress's mandatory um, deposit requirement and where that might go in the future? Um, because you know that's that's arguably I mean that's that's why Library of Congress is, is really cool. Um, I had an opportunity to chat with one of the people there in acquisition. And I had no idea uh, the extent of Library of Congress. I mean, they work on class of material for Senate. Um, they have you know uh, Jefferson's Library and all kinds of other stuff. They've been able to, you know, augment his library from a burned down because people just think they're so cool that they would, you know, get them to require them. So right. they just have everything that's old and new, and especially new, right? Right. And so again, I don't know the nuances of how um, the mandatory deposit actually uh, works with copyright. I, I don't. I, I think it's slightly separate from registering copyright, but it's kind of somewhat related. Right. And so, I mean, it seems like you know, 20 words, uh, you know, change in a, in a federal law um, could could say. Oh, and by the way, you know, just give us the proofs in electronic form, and suddenly you've got, I mean, I don't know what your circulation is, but you've got 90% or more um, full-text search um, that maybe could do something with Library of Congress. Again, you know, you're going to have industry maybe complaining about it, but that could be an extremely powerful uh, method uh, for libraries of, you know, across the United States and elsewhere to right. get that search. I mean, that would just, that could knock out, you know, a vast swath of these issues about e-books and that is an interesting question, so I'm going to try to like repeat it in a very short yeah. version. Um, so the question was, um, the Library of Congress has a mandatory <coughs> deposit requirement for new, new works in the U.S. Um, couldn't we leverage that with a change in laws? Yeah. And I think that it is possible that we could. It would still just be in the U.S. And how you would do the indexing and how the Library of Congress would deal with their backlog they have a backlog. Right. Um, these are questions yet to be answered, but you're right. There might there might actually be a policy way around this, um, and I'm interested in that. Okay. I, I will explore that more because Excellent. I'm curious about how that could potentially work. Following up on that, it seems like if the Library of Congress has a backlog and other libraries also have the same titles that you could crowdsource their, um, their backlog. I'm assuming that means like cataloging new materials. Right, so the question, uh, it was if the Library of Congress has a backlog and other libraries are on cataloging things, could they work together? And they do work together. Um, a lot of Library of Congress's backlog is actually just mostly old stuff. Um, I, I'd like to believe that they are up to date on the new stuff. I, I don't know for sure. Um, I know that they are understaffed for the amount they try to do. Um, but yes, yes, we do work together. That's one of the benefits of WorldCat, actually. It's one of the, like, Secret back end things that WorldCat does so we can share catalog records. Other questions, other thoughts?
All right. Well, if you have anything you want to like ask or you want to talk about and you don't want to talk about in front of the room, I'll hang out here. And I'm I'm really nice. I don't bite. Um, so please come talk to me. Even if you don't want to work on it, I won't push you into working on this open source project. I'll be I'll be nice to you. So thank you all for coming. And. Um,